Iran's historic attack on Israel didn't damage much of anything actually in Israel, but it did cost the Jewish state somewhere around $1.3 billion. That according to the latest expert analysis of the ordeal. The Israel Defense Force says 99% of the 300 or so threats fired from Iran were intercepted. Iran used an assortment of drones and missiles in its attack, which was said to be in retaliation for an Israeli strike that killed two Iranian generals. There was some footage from Iranian social media which showed at least some of the drones and missiles fired from Iran failed to leave Iranian airspace, instead falling on fields and some homes below. Israel employs some of the world's foremost air defense systems taking a layered approach to its success. The Iron Dome protects against short-range rockets, artillery, and small drones. David's sling is useful against planes, larger drones, tactical missiles, and ballistic missiles. And the Aero missile system can take out threats like ICBMs while still in the upper atmosphere. But defense costs more than offense. A single interceptor from an Iron Dome costs $30,000. One launch from David's sling is roughly $700,000, and an Arrow 2 missile is $1.5 million. The upgraded Arrow 3s are going for around $2 million a pop. And these are all orders of magnitude more expensive than the weapons they're designed to interdict. So let's go ahead and break down that historic attack by Iran against Israel. The reason why it's being called historic is it's the first time that Iran has launched anything from its own territory to attack Israel directly. Uh, but hardly the first time Iran has tried to attack Israel. Uh, there is an argument being made that Iran sent just enough munitions for Israel to kind of swat it down, um, just enough for Iran to save face, but not enough to actually uh, warrant a huge response from Israel um, and blow off a full-on kinetic conflict between the two. There is another argument being made that perhaps Iran is uh, pulling a playbook out of uh, Russia's uh, playbook from Ukraine and employing a tactic that Russia is using to almost perfection in Ukraine, which is overwhelming um, an expensive air defense system with a bunch of cheap, uh, cheap munitions that you're willing to lose all in, in hope of exhausting the supply of the air defense system. So let's go ahead and break down exactly uh, what we're talking about here. When Iran attacked its uh, historic attack, it launched right around 300 cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and drones uh, at Israel. It took a few hours for, for those to get there. Um, at the same time, it's not like Hamas in Gaza or Hezbollah in southern Lebanon or any of the number of IRGC factions working with different uh, misaligned groups in Syria and you know, even some terrorist organizations in Iraq. ISIS is still here. They all hate Israel. They're all attacking kind of, you know, not all the time, but there's always that threat of attack, right? Uh, and while Iran was attacking, it's not like Hezbollah stopped or the Houthis, who are down at the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula launching uh, attacks at the Red Sea. Um, it's not like they stopped launching these drones uh, as well, which could conceivably hit uh, Israel also. So Israel has kind of a wide net that it needs to uh, defend against from air attacks, which is why Israel has uh, the benefit of allies in the area, uh, namely the U.S. and the Red Sea. Um, the U.S. is also in the Mediterranean. The U.K., France um, also has some, some vessels in the area. And all of these ships, all of these allies, all of the air defense systems in Israel are all working together in a unified fashion to stop all of these threats from from coming in and creating, you know, sort of a net or a cage around Israel uh, to, to prevent all of these other attacks. Now, at some point, all of these cheap munitions, you know, we gotta remember Iran has a bunch of oil money that it's sitting on and a, a, a burgeoning drone industry. Uh, so they have the time, the money, and the resources to keep sending these small attacks over and over and over again at Israel. And eventually those attacks are going to exhaust the supply of the munitions in Israel. Uh, you know, every, every missile, every drone that an ally takes down is one more interceptor that Israel still has in its use. But 
the Navy destroyers that are out here in the oceans cannot be resupplied at sea. They carry a finite number of, of missiles on board. So eventually those ships will have to rotate out to go get more missiles. Um, eventually, if these, depending on how long these attacks stay, stay going, you know, you could conceivably see Israel potentially running out of, of interceptors like what's happening in Ukraine. I don't really see that happening, but that's the idea behind these attacks, which is why so many people are saying, where are the laser weapons which can deal with these things very quickly? In addition to high energy lasers, there's also high energy microwaves, and both of those make up a category of weapons called directed energy weapons. I've reported before on a lot of these types of weapons currently in development, so you can get some more good breakdowns of those over at san.com if you want more. But here's basically where that technology stands. It isn't perfect, but it's maturing. There are plenty of countries trying to develop this technology. The U.S. Department of Defense spends around a billion dollars a year developing directed energy weapons. The United States uses several types of microwave systems that are good against smaller drones, even waves of them, but they have a limited distance. Lasers give commanders a little more of that standoff capability they crave, and for a fraction of the engagement cost of most any kinetic option. On average, a shot from a high-energy laser is in the neighborhood of $11 to $12. But getting the weapon out of the lab and into the field on a large scale is proving to be quite complicated. The U.S. Navy is experimenting with some high-energy lasers aboard several vessels, but there is no fleet-wide option yet. The Air Force just ditched its plans to put a laser on a Special Forces gunship. Israeli-based Rafael is working with the U.S. company Lockheed Martin to further develop the iron beam into more of an operational weapon. There's no timeline on when that project will reach completion, though. The British Ministry of Defense hit a major testing milestone in March with its directed energy weapon, something the U.K. calls Dragonfire. The laser took down aerial targets for the first time in the test. Dragonfire is reportedly accurate enough to hit a one-pound coin at a kilometer away. And for those who don't do metric, that means it can hit a one-inch target from a distance of about two-thirds of a mile. Dragonfire's production was already fast-tracked once, so it could be fielded by 2027. However, the UK is now thinking about sending the system to Ukraine even sooner than that, because an imperfect system is better than nothing at all. So, while directed energy weapons certainly seem like the perfect tech to counter the current threat, Developing those weapons into fieldable units is going to take more time and more money.